Oh, before I get up here. Well, hello. hello. Welcome to winter. <laughs> you guys know how much I love snow. Uh, oh, it's, it's still good, though, right? It's still good. It's so nice that you can all be here today. Um, excited to begin our countdown uh, to Christmas, uh, the season. Oh, my goodness. There we are. I'm so excited. I'm forgetting to do things all over. Forgot to finish getting dressed. Forgot to put on my headset. There we are. It is good to be here. We'll start with announcements. Ministry of the month. Um, this month is the Retired Pastors Fund, and it gives us an opportunity to support uh, pastors who uh, gave so much of themselves over years when maybe it was a little hard for their churches to give back to them. Um, for whatever reasons, there, this is a, a great ministry that we can support with our prayers and our resources. Um, we want to keep donating to the food bank this month as well if we can. Uh, canned milk and canned fruit are the items of uh, desire this month. Uh, egg cartons and plastic bottles can be brought in at any time. And if you have things for the food bank, we have blue bins at the back of the building, just to the right of the door, and uh, the food bank sends over elves every week to check and see what we have, and they gather up those things and take them over for us. Um, it's an efficient little system that you can easily contribute to. Um, activities at the church this week, uh, we'll have our praise team practice on Monday evening for those who are able. We'll have Bible study on Tuesday evening, uh, working our way through the distinctives of uh, us Baptists, we Baptists, and um, it's been a fun study. It really has. The conversations are interesting, and um, we're learning a lot together, and I, I just um, am so encouraged by how God is working through that. You wouldn't think that a Bible study on Baptist distinctives would, would be as, as fun as it's turning out to be, which is great. Um, this uh, Wednesday, the pastoral team and I will meet here on Wednesday evening. On Thursday evening, we'll have our prayer meeting on Zoom. So there's something pretty much every night of the week this week for us, with the exception of Friday. Um, and I want to draw your attention, if I could to our uh, count on the wall. Now that bottom row, the bottom row, uh, the kind of almost the shape of a smiling face with 20 women on it, all 20 of those women have books. So we have met our goal for hopeful gifts. And now you'll see that we have added five more women to the top line, and we have three of those women who now we have covered um, for helping them uh, with literacy, learning to read and to write. And this is a, a tremendous uh, thing. I'm so, um, so thankful for the way you guys have uh, stepped up to give. And we're going to continue this, this right up until the end of December. Uh, Nellie's got a video for us, a little encouragement for us as we think and work our way through this. In your life, I'm sure you've found that the right gift can make a real difference. Through the Hopeful Gifts Church Campaign, you can make a significant impact in the lives of the most vulnerable around the world and witness to your local community concerning what it looks like to love like Jesus. In Rwanda, poverty, illiteracy, and gender imbalance are major problems that can be found among women. Those who rely solely on their husbands or on traditional farming can find their families struggling to meet their daily needs. There is an opportunity to empower the whole family by empowering women. CBM has partnered with the Association of Rwandan Baptist Churches to train local church pastors and leaders to offer educational training through community programs. When women are given the skills and support to grow, they have an increased sense of self-worth and the well-being of their families improves. By empowering women to grow holistically, the mindsets of poverty, ignorance, and gender discrimination are addressed. Women who are literate 
and who have had access to vocational skills training are not only empowered to help contribute to their own family's needs, but also they contribute to the development of the communities in which they live and their churches. Making these opportunities available will help women and their families in Rwanda to break through barriers that hinder them from reaching their potential, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And it will empower their contribution to those around them. Thank you for considering the Hopeful Gifts Church campaign. Your gift will make a real difference in Rwanda through women's literacy education and economic development. Visit rwanda.hopefulgifts.ca to support your church's campaign and give a gift of hope. So as a church, we've given the gift of hope to 23 women. Um, that is tremendous, and I know that these women have friends who also need the gift of hope. And I love that, you know, they identified, they've identified three key things. They've identified poverty, literacy, and gender imbalance. And by focusing on the literacy aspect, we actually can work into all three of those things. Because as the women gain these skills, they gain skills that will help them overcome poverty and gain skills that will help the family overcome gender imbalance and break down some of the barriers that have, um, you know, just lasted through decades and centuries. So we are doing good works here, and I just want to encourage you to continue with, uh, with your givings for that. And um, just to be clear on that, you don't have to give $50 to help one woman. If all you have is a few dollars to help one woman, give it, and it will help. And others will give some as well, and it all pools together. So every little bit um, is, is helping toward this gift, this hopeful gift of change. We can also make sure we pray for them and lift them up as well. Allie, would you like to open us up this morning? Morning, everyone. You know, it doesn't matter what the weather is. God always brings the beauty out in, in our land. And it's just gorgeous out there today. Bob would say, hmm, snow, because he has to shovel it. But <laughs> unlike Monica, I just love it. Our call to worship this morning is, is Rev, Revelations 4.11. You are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Let us bow our, hair, bow our heads in prayer. <coughs> Father, thank you for never changing. You are reliable and trustworthy. Everything you give us is a blessing and a gift. Thank you for being our source of strength, comfort, and provision. Every good things we have is because of you. We come today to show this in prayer, word, and song. May you be truly honored. This we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So on the theme of prayer, word, and song, I'm going to invite you to join in the singing of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, and I'll invite you to stand.
Amen. I'd like to invite uh, the Demchenkos to come forward at this time for our lighting of the Advent candle this morning. Good morning. Today's Advent reading is the first Sunday in Advent for hopeful gifts. Today's gift is candle of hope. Isaiah 9, 2, 6, and 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. On the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. As we gather today, we claim the gift of hope that is in Christ Jesus. We are aware of the despair that is all around us. We hear about it globally, famine, climate change, disease. We know about it locally, racism, inequality, poverty. And we experience it personally, depression, anxiety, broken relationships. Into this darkness, the light has come. Into this hopelessness and despair came the gift of hope, Jesus Christ. In the face of despair, we light a candle of hope. May the light from this candle say to all that may the light from this candle say to all that God's hope is coming on earth as it already is in heaven. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings of, like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isaiah 40, 31. Friends, do not be afraid. Do not despair. God's hope has come. Let us reflect on the gift of hope this Advent season. Thank you, Serge and Connie, for that. I love that we still, and I guess the importance of this time of setting apart um, some focus on these key things. I love it, and I thank you for will, your willingness to take part in the lighting of the candles in this way. We have a call to worship this morning, sorry, we have a responsive reading this morning, and you'll notice uh, that this responsive reading starts with all and the leader will respond. So let's join our voices in this call to worship. What can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good. So then, we should bow before God most high with offering of yearling calves? No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good. Yes, right. So we should offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil. No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good. What he requires of you is to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What can we bring to the Lord is ourselves, to love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Allie. So the praise team has been working on a song um, 
a special offering uh, that we want to share with you this morning. So I'm going to invite the praise team to come up and join me on stage.
come together and sing songs and share in that. Thank you for permitting us that, and we pray that that was a blessing to you all today. We're going to enter into our time of uh, pastoral prayer at this time. <coughs> Do you have a reading? Okay. Let's, yes. How about we follow my order of service, Allie? Let's do it that way. So, no, you've got it right. I've got it wrong. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's all right. That's great. Um, so, you're going to read Isaiah? Yes. Okay, perfect. It will be, but she's, she can read it. Yep. So, let's pray. Gracious and loving Father, God of hope, Lord, we are, we are so overwhelmed by your grace and your love, God. We just, we come together today thinking on, looking forward to the celebration of Christmas, God, but knowing that there's so much um, that we have to be thankful for. We think about hope and the promises that you have for us, Lord. It's overwhelming. It is overwhelming to know that we have such forgiveness, such empowerment through Holy Spirit. God, as your church together here today, we thank you for those you have put in our path, the friends you have put beside us through this journey, Lord, the brothers and sisters in Christ who you have brought to us. Lord, the love that we have, may it touch others and let them know that they too are loved. May they desire to know you, God, as we desire to live out our lives in praise of you, lives of worship, Lord. This morning, God, we lift to you our prayers for our nation and troubling times as the environment is giving us um, struggles, the storms and the devastation that parts of the country are going through, God, it, it's overwhelming to see the pictures and to hear the stories. Lord, we just lift to you those situations, those people. We thank you for folks who are, uh, people who know you, who are in the midst of that, doing good works, loving others. God, we just praise you for them. And we pray, God, for more like them. And God, we pray uh, for our nation as we uh, continue in this uh, ongoing epidemic. And the times we are in, God, we thank you that we can come together and worship. We thank you that we can come together for study and things such as that. It is wonderful. But God, we just pray that you continue to give us a desire to be careful and cautious and to love one another through those acts of caution and care. Help us, Lord, to use good judgment. God, we pray for your wisdom at this time. And Lord, as we look forward to Christmas, may you give us such confidence in the hope that we can have in you such confidence in the joy that we can have in knowing you, such confidence in the love that you have for us, God. We praise you and thank you, Lord, as your church here in Nikta. As we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Allie's going to give us our scripture reading today. Can I, can I, can I, can I? <laughs> Our reading this morning is from Isaiah 2, 1 to 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw.
concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against the nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. May God add his blessings to this reading. Amen. Thank you. So the prophet Isaiah wrote those words, spoke those words. And Isaiah was somewhere in the vicinity of 700 years uh, before the coming of Christ. And it was at a time when Jerusalem, uh, the Jews, uh, the Hebrew people were um, embattled. And there was, there was strife with other nations. And the king at that time made an alliance with a nation against Isaiah's kind of instruction. Isaiah had been given a vision from God that said not to do that. And he really was trying to guide the nation in that way. But the king did it anyway. And God was not pleased because what happened in that was when they made this alliance, the people began to worship the gods of that nation. And it took their attention away from Yahweh. And we know that God really desires us to focus our attention on him. There should be no other gods beside him. And Isaiah was in that time, in that struggle with the nation not doing as God would please and him knowing it and God working in him and calling him to raise his voice against what was happening, drawing people's attention to to turn from their sins and turn to God. That was the yesterday. Now the hope that they had at that time was the sending of the Messiah, the, the, the descendant promised to David. The Christ. And that didn't come for 700 years. And in that 700 years, God sent many prophets. And those many prophets, even though they came at different times and there was different struggles, there was kind of one common reverberation of the prophets. Turn from your sins and turn to God. That's, that's a big generalization, but that's basically what it boils down to. The prophets were to call the nation to turn from their sins and turn to God. That's the yesterday. The hope was always that God would bless them when they knew the Messiah to come. They looked forward to the sending of the Messiah. The prophets kept calling the people to turn from their sin, to turn to God. And when the Messiah finally does come on the scene, it's I love the way the Gospels introduce this story because what we're introduced to first before we're introduced to the story of Jesus in Luke. And, well, let's see here if it's Matthew we get the understanding that God is sending the prophet first. John the Baptist. We learn of John and the sending of John before we learn of the sending of Jesus. John's ministry, his birth, John was born first. John's ministry happened before Jesus. And John's death happened before Jesus. Those three things. John led In all of those important things, John was a prophet in the time of Jesus. And you want to know what the message of John was at that time? You guys are going to get shocked by this message. The message was, turn from God, or turn from your sins and turn to God. 
It would be shocking if it was turned from God. That would be utterly shocking. That's not what it was. It was turn from your sins and turn to God. That's what John was doing. John was that voice in the wilderness crying out to turn from sin. And we learn about the birth of John in the story of Luke. In Luke's account of the birth of Jesus, John is foretold first. It says, while well, Zechariah, this is John's dad, was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw the angel. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. See, Zechariah was praying for a son. God heard the prayer, but what God gave was so much more than a son to Zechariah and Elizabeth. When God blessed them, he gave them a son, and he gave the nation a prophet. John was someone special, heralding in Jesus. When um, Mary learns of her pregnancy, it's in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. This is John's mom. So she's six months underway when Elizabeth learns uh, through an angel that she's pregnant. A virgin named Mary was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Oh, that's important. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You'll name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign forever over Israel. Mary is given these beautiful words and surely frightening words as well. She learns of this and she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And Mary has a song that she sings. She says, My soul praises the Lord. My soul rejoices in God my Savior for he took notice of this lowly servant girl from Now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. He is a mighty arm and he's done tremendous things. He scattered the proud and the haughty. He's brought down princes from their thrones. He's exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away with empty hands, and he's helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. He made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. See, Mary understood something. Mary understood that what God was giving was not just her son, but something for the world. He's filled the hungry with good things. He sent away the rich with empty hands. He's helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. When Jesus comes on the scene, folks, it is for a purpose. Jesus has been foretold by the prophets. They were expecting the Messiah to come. There is purpose in the sending of Christ. Now, I got to tell you, in my preparations for this week, God was working on me. Holy smoke. I wrote, I wrote Friday, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I said to Charlene, I said, I just spent the day writing something that I can never use. God was working on me. The problem, the reason I can't use what I wrote is because it was Conviction. So I'm not going to use what I wrote, but I'm going to explain what God was doing to me. 
And I pray that it has a similar effect on you. The hope of Advent. When we talk about hope, you know, we use the word hope, we think of something that might happen. I hope that we don't see more snow until January. (laughs) Okay? That's how hope works in our world and our language. But the hope that we have in Christ is not really hope in that way. It's expectation more than hope. It is expectation that God is going to do what God said he's going to do. The the Israelites, they had expectation, hope, of the Messiah to come. Jesus came on the scene. Jesus did miraculous things. He fed people. He healed people. He loved people. People, he called people to turn from their sins and turn to God. Jesus died, was resurrected, was seen by many, and in doing that, he canceled the debt for our sins. When we celebrate and think about hope, those are the things that we should be thinking about. The hope that we have in knowing God and knowing that God loves us that much and that God's promises will be fulfilled. That's where our hope should lie. And I got thinking about Christmas and hope. And the other day I was watching television with my granddaughter, which is awesome. I love the Paw Patrol. Hey. (laughs) who? I mean, it's great. But the commercials, oh my goodness. The commercials, the toys. The want. They, they feed our wants. We hope in Christ and we look forward to all the things that God has promised us. But when we celebrate Christmas, we fill it with stuff. We fill Christmas with stuff, not relationship with Christ. And God was just pounding this on me. Making me see how I have done this. Turn from your sins and turn to him. Christmas, hope. We're teaching our children to hope for gifts. We're teaching our grandchildren to hope for gifts. Now, some of us are further away from this than others. Some of us will be thinking, well, we we really didn't do that much in the way of buying things and making Christmas about things instead of about Christ. And, And I praise God for that if that's you. That is not me. Christmas in my life has become about other things too often. I've, I've been on this path of turning back to God for a while, and God's working that in me. But this week, God is bringing attention to me. He's like, Jeff, there have been storms all over. You're surrounded by devastation. You're surrounded by disease. When are you going to turn from your sins and turn to me? The hope of Christmas is not in the gifts. It is in the people I put around you. It is in the Savior, Jesus, who is working in you and teaching you and calling you to repent, to turn from your sins and turn to God. When will I start to listen? This was page 2 of 12. (laughs) It was a long day. Hope in our lives is about the risen Christ and his power to bring healing and restoration. Mary said it in her song. He filled the hungry with good things. He sent the rich away with empty hands. Storms, devastation, disease, what, is, what have all these things got in common? They teach us that we're not as mighty as we think we are. We're not gods. We don't control those things. There's only one almighty God. God has remembered to be merciful, though. He's made promises to ancestors, to the Israelites, to the followers of Christ, to you and I. He promises that our sins are forgiven. 
He promises to send Holy Spirit and fill us and empower us and guide us and lead us and teach us. And he will make us uncomfortable from time to time. That is part of being a follower of Christ. It's, it's listening to some stories of how others are loving their neighbors and thinking, darn, I missed an opportunity there. Or how you've messed up in teaching your kids the wrong things about Christmas. For a lot of years, I was, I was not an absent father by any means, but I was really career-driven. I loved my job. Loved my job. I loved to work. I had responsibility. I had people who depended on me, and that just fueled me. It made me feel important and special. And I remember when my daughter, you know, I would be sitting at the table answering emails. This was even before the time of text messaging, really. And my daughter saying, you know, I don't know if you should be looking at your phone while we're having dinner. And this is my daughter. She's like a teenager, and she's calling me out on these things. She didn't even really want to be with me at that point in her life, and she's calling me out in this stuff. I allowed Christmas to become something that it should never have been because I was trying to make up for the things that I wasn't. I wasn't present in the way that I should have been. Do you know what my kids probably really wanted for Christmas? They probably would have really liked just hanging out, having some fun, playing some games. Probably with toys that they already own, we could have had a really good time. We owned enough stuff. We didn't need more of it. So my challenge, I guess, is to figure out how to teach my generations to come after me, my family, to focus on Christ at Christmas. Sure, gifts can be part of that. But they don't have to be all of it. And never should they be. This is not what Christmas is about. Christmas needs to focus on Christ. And this year, God is really stirring in me to turn from my sins and turn to him. And you guys get the joy of listening to me go through that and share it with you because that's what God does. <laughs> he loves us. He makes us uncomfortable and he pulls us to new places. And sometimes we make sometimes we make it hard on ourselves because we don't want to be pulled into new places. And sometimes we go pretty pretty willingly. But our hope needs to be rooted in who God is. And we shouldn't come in here on Sunday and light the candle and talk about our salvation in Christ and all that means to us and then run out to the mall and buy 35 things for our children. That can't be how it works. That can't be how it works, folks. We need to do better. In this world where we're making too much stuff and we're throwing too many things away, we need to reframe how we think. And if we can't do it as a church, as people of Christ, then I don't know. I, we're, in a, we're in a tough spot. We are in a tough spot. God is calling us at this time to turn from our sins and turn to him. Just as he always has been. The yesterday is the same as today, is the same as tomorrow. God desires our attention. We need to stop worshiping the things, the stuff, the power that we have. And realize that he is the one with the power. And he is the one who saves and he is the one who empowers and blesses. And the more we give up, and the more we turn to him, and this, is, this has been consistent in my life. This has been one of the few things that I've really learned. There hasn't been many things that I can say with absolute confidence. But this is one thing I've really learned. Every time I give of myself more to God, I receive more than I ever gave. Every time 
I turn toward him in a new and fresh way, I receive something utterly life-transforming and life-changing. And that's a truth. And I just pray that as a church we can, we can experience that together and share those experiences with one another, uplift one another, and help one another to grow in knowing him in a new and fresh way as we think about Advent and work our way toward Christmas in the coming weeks. I pray that your hope is in the Lord Jesus. And I want this to be a, a happy and joyous time for us the fact that, that I'm feeling convicted at this time is a reason for joy and happiness because it proves just how alive and well Christ is in us. Christ is moving and stirring and doing. This is not something of the past that happened long ago that we just carried on to today because it's a happy tradition. Christ is alive in Holy Spirit in us and it is stirring in us and convicting me, I'm guessing others as well. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. So may God bless us as we spend our time focusing on Advent, the love of Christ, and the coming of Christ, and what that means to the world. Christ is our Savior. I want to invite Linda back up to the stage at this time, and we're going to join our voices We're going to sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. This song is, every time I sing this song, there's, some, there's something in this song that there's a tension in it. There's that longing. There's, there's the understanding that Christ, um, Christ is here and doing, but there's still longing because there's more promises to be fulfilled. So let's join our voices as we stand together. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Peoples 
Rejoice, rejoice. God, we pray for your wisdom. God, we pray for you to order all things. God, we pray for you to guide us in your path of knowledge. We pray for you to help us to see your way, Lord. And we rejoice in you. In Christ's name, amen. So may the God of hope fill you.